So the conventional loan here is an 80% loan to value. So let me ask you a question. If this value goes down to here, it drops because of a bad market or anything like that. Whose money got lost? Whose money took the hit? The answer is it's the homeowner's money because the bank has only loaned this amount and it's the first lien. So they're going to get the first money despite if the value's here or the value's here or the value's here. So the lender doesn't actually care. All right. So in this 80% loan to value, the lender doesn't really care if the value fluctuates a little bit because their loan is only 80% of the original when we did the deal. There is some, cur some security here and that equity may get lost to the consumer, but the bank certainly doesn't care. Now, I'm going to change the story again. So let's look at this for example. Let's say we have a value here. That's the amount of the value of the property. And let's say the loan amount is exactly the same. What would be the loan to value on this scenario? where the loan and the value are the exact same number. In this example, the loan to value is 100%, right? The loan was 100,000, the house was appraised at 100,000, that is a loan to value of 100%. How much equity does the homeowner have in this deal? You should obviously get right out of the gate nothing. They have borrowed 100% of the loan. These loans used to exist right up until we had trouble with them. Now, I will tell you, you will start seeing these come back because people inherently are greedy, and you are now starting to see these loan values creep up, okay? But let's get back to this. Now, in this scenario, let's say the value drops because of a bad market. But the loan amount doesn't drop. It still stays the same. So what you now have is a loan of 100 and maybe a value of 95. You are actually what we call what? Upside down. You are underwater. We joke about this with cars, right? We buy a new car and we drive it off the lot and we go, hey, this thing's worth half of what I paid for it. You're upside down. That can happen in this scenario. It is possible that the e equity actually can go negative equity. I owe 100 on a property that's only worth 95. That is a negative equity situation. That is underwater. That is upside down, however you want to look at it. In this particular case, Whose money now is in jeopardy? The bank's, right? Because the bank is the one that loaned you 100%. Does the bank care? Oh, hell yes. They care so much that if they loan you more than this 80% that they're comfortable with, if they loan you 81%, 85%, 96%, 100%,
they care so much, they are going to ask you to buy a mortgage insurance policy to cover them. Welcome to PMI. PMI is the private mortgage insurance. It is an insurance policy that protects the lender if that happens. But here's the kicker. Guess who's going to pay that PMI? You are. You are paying for the insurance policy because the lender is actually loaning you more than they felt comfortable with. They're doing you a solid, dude, by loaning you 100%. And because of that, you are going to buy an insurance policy and you're going to pay for it that says if the value goes below the loan and you get in trouble and we have to foreclose upon you and we can't get our money back, we are upside down, they can actually go to their insurance company and get PMI because you paid for it. So theoretically, if there is an amount above that 80, all the way up to that 100, they are going to force PMI. And that PMI is prorated. What I mean by that is, let's say you borrow 85. That insurance policy may be smaller than if you borrowed 95, okay, than if you borrowed the full 100. So you can get prorated PMI. Just because it's over 80, that percentage that goes over 80 is what they are insuring. This top 20 to 22% is what is being insured. And it's prorated depending on the amount. Whether is it 5% over? Is it 15% over? And that PMI. Now, at some point in your career or your life, when you have that loan amount that is 100% and you have that value... This is an example of 100% loan to value. During the lifetime of this loan, you can actually get this 100% loan to value down to 80% loan to value. How could I do that? There are two ways I can do that, all right? I could actually lower the loan amount to create that 20% equity. I could have a good day at the casino, walk into the bank and go, dude, here's 20 grand to help pay down my loan. And what I have created is an LTV of 80% because I lowered the loan. That is one way you could do that. There is a second way you could do that. You could actually raise the value and once again create an 80% loan to value because now the loan stays the same, but the value is higher. You guys get what I'm saying, right? You could lower the loan and make that 80%, or you could raise the value and make that 80%. Either way, Once you get a 20 to 22% equity position, and they say 20 to 22% because there's always some, you know, fluctuations or argument, PMI is supposed to go away because you no longer need it, because you now have that 80%. Now, I will tell you the most common way that this happens Let's draw this line here and say it's 100% loan to value. The most common way is as you make mortgage payments over the years, you will lower the loan and the house will appreciate value. So the value will go up. So you create that 80% that way. That's the most common way. You know, not just one, there's a combination of the two that creates this spread through P. 
paying your monthly payment and appreciation in the house. All right. And once that happens, that 80% will be generated and PMI goes off. So when you hear the term conventional loan, what you should think, that's not right, conventional, is an 80% loan to value, no PMI. That is the definition when most mortgage loan originators, most uh, lenders talk about a conventional loan as being an 80% loan to value, no PMI. Now, I am here to tell you there are all kinds of games now being played with this word. Um, but for this test, I want you to understand that's what conventional means. 80% loan to value, no PMI. Okay? So on these conventional loans, this is what we are talking about. They are the lowest loan to value, i.e. the 80%. And PMI protects that lender if that person has less than 20% down, meaning their loan is higher, right? That's the inverse of saying what I just said. If they have 10% down, that means they borrowed 90%. That's what we are talking about. And as soon as that PMI reaches that 20 to 22%, there is an, a loan called the Homeowner Protection Act, which requires that PMI to come off. And thus, your monthly house payment goes down. Once again, it's another term about house payment. When someone goes, well, my house payment's $1,700. Well, yeah, dude, there's a $200 a month PMI payment that might come off. And people go, well, my house payment went down because I'm not paying PMI. Well, yes, because you generated some income, Okay. Are we good so far? If you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com. Now, what I want to get into now are the three or four big governmental service agency or enterprise loans. And this is a misnomer that we talk about all the time. The first one is this thing called an FHA insured loan. Okay. So people say this all the time. I say it all the time. I'll be honest with you. People go, well, it's an FHA loan. Understand, FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, which is a department of HUD, does not loan money. It is not an FHA loan. FHA doesn't loan money. It's an FHA insured loan, meaning that the bank will loan the money to you and the FHA merely insures the bank that the person they loaned it to is a good person, okay? Think of the FHA insured loan almost like a cosigner, all right? So if you decide you want to get an FHA loan, the money is still going to come from Chase Bank. The fact is, FHA just tells Chase, hey dude, Raymond's a good guy. Go ahead and loan him money. If something happens, we'll cover Raymond. So it's an FHA insured loan. And I go fill out paperwork at the FHA, and I go through all the background check just like I would a normal loan, and the FHA goes, yeah, okay, we are a good guy. Now go to the bank and get your mortgage or your loan or your money. And then I go to a bank that is approved FHA lender meaning that the FHA has agreed to work with Chase Bank or Huntington Bank or U.S. Bank. They maybe don't work with Bob's Bank, so you can't go get money from Bob because Bob's not an approved FHA lender. They are not a partner with HUD. 
that bank had to establish a relationship with the FHA to be able to be one of their approved lenders. If the bank chose not to do that, that's fine. You, as the borrower, just can't use that bank because the, you can only go to an FHA-approved bank. Most of the FHA loans are 10 to 30 years, and you can buy a one to four unit family residence as long as you live in one of the units. This is often a misconception when people say, well, you can't use FHA for investment properties. Well, you kind of can because you could buy a four unit apartment complex as long as you live in one of the four and rent the other three out, that is an approved or an approvable FHA loan. What I could not do is borrow money and have the FHA insure it on a four unit that I don't live in. That is a true investment property, and yeah, they don't do that. Now, to borrow that loan, you actually will pay a fee up front. So you are going to pay for the right to borrow their money. That is called an upfront mortgage premium or an MIP. People get these confused with PMI all the time. PMI is private mortgage insurance. And MIP is a monthly insurance premium or a mortgage insurance premium. It is the money that you pay FHA because how do you think they're going to make money? They got to make money somehow because it's not their money they're loaning. So they don't make the loan origination fee. They don't make the monthly interest. All they make is this money here that you pay up front for the right for that co-signer to say, yes, we'll co-sign for Raymond. You're paying them off, all right? Now, the biggest reason people love FHA is because of the low requirement for a down payment. The down payment on an FHA from the consumer can be as low as only 3.5%, right? So if your down payment is 3.5%, how much is your loan to value? If my down payment... If my down payment is 3.5% down, then my LTV is going to be 96.5%. What this, in essence, does is allow me to buy a bigger home because I need less money down. This is the most common, best attribute as to why a person would use an FHA, is they only need, uh, let's go back to that $100,000 house. If you were getting a conventional loan, you need 20% equity, right? 80% loan to value. So you would need to bring $20,000 to closing just for the equity portion. Now, if you're buying that same home with an FHA loan, or an FHA, see, I just did it, <laughs> with an FHA insured home loan, you would only need to bring $3,500. So this is a much easier loan for people, and it allows for them to get a bigger home because of the low down payment. So I want to add something here to the video to redo this calculation and maybe make it a little more clear. Um, we were talking about getting a bigger loan with an FHA because of the down payment. And I showed you that math, but let's look at it a different way. Let's say someone had $20,000 in the bank. Your client comes to you and says, I've got 20 grand in the bank. Now, if they get a conventional loan, they would need 20%. So if you divide that by the 20% that they need, that tells the person that they could only get a $100,000 home. 
Now watch this. If they had that same 20 grand and they get an FHA loan where the requirement is actually only three and a half percent down, that would allow them to get a five hundred and seventy one thousand four hundred and twenty eight dollar house. See the difference in this down payment? See the what difference it makes by only having to have three and a half versus twenty? It will increase the value of the home. That's what I was trying to say.